that's being conveyed. As we talked last week, we're not looking at uh, a teaching that's being put forth. It's simply a historic narrative. And yet I would contend that Genesis chapter 1 is probably one of the most controversial chapters in the entire Bible. And I, and I struggle even within Christian circles sometimes at how we interpret that. And, and it's my opinion that so often we, because how we've been raised, whatever we've been taught, that we are influenced and, and in, I believe in a negative way because we, we trust so much in man's opinion. We see men who are educated and certainly have much to bring in life but they often can influence us in a negative way. And so when we come to Genesis chapter 1, we are confused often. Uh, we reinterpret it. We question what really is being said there. And so what I want to do tonight is try to unpack some key ideas, some key thoughts. Certainly, I welcome the questions, as I mentioned last week. Please don't be bashful as we go along. And we'll see how the evening unfolds and how far we get into this list tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. There's just some wonderful insights here. So let's start with point number one. And if you would turn, if you have not already gotten to Genesis chapter one, certainly go ahead and make your way that direction. We're not going to go far right off the bat. But as we look at Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now I've got point number one is God's greatness is on display here. You know, it's interesting when you think about what Moses is doing here. Because in many respects, I believe he's really contrasting the Creator and the creation. Because at some levels, we might, and I remember some high school students several years ago, one of them asked me, who created God? You know, and I think intuitively we think because so much of life has this, where did it come from, process. You know, we look at an automobile and we recognize that if you take it all the way back to its most basic form, we recognize it has a process, but it had a beginning. And we don't want to know where these beginnings came from. And so intuitively, intuitively we think this way. And so we often look to God and say, well, we assume that He had to come from somewhere. And I think we're caught off guard about what it means to be eternal. And I think what Moses has done here in this first statement, in the beginning, God, is he has assumed for us that God simply is. And if you think about what Moses, how you come into uh, Exodus chapter 3, and Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush, and he's frustrated, and he's fearful of what he's about to get into. He asks God, you know, you need to find somebody else. And finally he works his way down and he says, you know, if I'm going to do this, they're going to ask me, who is it that sent me? I need a name. I need something to go on. And what does, how does God respond to Moses? I am. I am that I am. I am that I am. And I point this out is the state of being God simply is. God is not becoming, did not come from anywhere else. He is. And I think this is a key fundamental idea in life. I wish I had brought my little apple. I keep a little plastic apple with me. Because, uh, not because I need a snack. <laughs> but I hold this apple up and I ask people, where does the apple come from? And you would answer, Tree. Apple tree. You're doing good. This is the right answer. <laughs> no trick questions here. Not yet, anyway. But where does the apple tree come from? Apple seeds. Apple seeds. And where do we get our apple seeds from? Where do we get our apple from? <laughs> We've got a problem. Right? So to speak. What do we now recognize? That there had to be an origin. It to be an origin, but the reason for the existence of the apple is not contained within the apple. The apple itself does not explain where it came from and how it got here. It doesn't contain that information. 
ultimately what we find is there's nothing in life that contains the reason for its existence within itself. Nothing. And so if we step back and just be a little philosophical for just a moment, we recognize that what we need is something that transcends life. We need that thing to be eternal because if we keep going back with this begot that, with that begot that, but we keep going circular, we never come to an answer and we never are able to solve the problem. And I will tell you that God is the only entity that is sufficient to answer that fundamental question. He's the only entity. And because of his eternality, <clears throat> he is sufficient. So everything of creation flows from God. Flows from his mind, his power. Even when you go back and consider the apple, fairly simple is structure. But, but even in that simple form, if the skin around the apple did not exist, if the seeds weren't present, if the stem wasn't present, if there were no roots for the tree, then it would fail to exist. And at a basic level, the, the tree, the apple, life, is ultimately irreducibly complex. The human cell is that is that one of those key pieces of illustration for us that if we were to start removing any one element of the cell, it would die and cease to function. There is design in life. It's obvious. Once again, God is that sufficient and only sufficient entity to answer these fundamental questions of life. Coming down just a little bit. God was already present, eternal. God was and is the reason for creation existing. Creation is thought of in terms of ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. God spoke and it was. And then God's perfect purpose and plan was realized, divine fiat, which again is because God chose creation to come into existence. It did. And we have a God who sits there on the throne with these powers, these abilities, and we're always subjection in subjection to Him. Any questions, any thoughts on that first point? Just three words that many composers use. The seity, self-existent, and pre-existent that are all good terms to get your mind around. Mm -hmm. Because everything has a beginning to the sea the God has, he exists so totally independent. Mm -hmm. And the self-existence and pre-existence. So he, he transcends what we have in front of us. He transcends who we are. He's not part of creation. He invests in creation. He comes and communes with us. But he's not a part of creation, which really conflicts with some of the worldview, some of the other religious worldviews. Any other thoughts, yes, George? If we grab the truth of Genesis 1-1, you have no trouble with the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Tell me more why you say that, though. Well, if indeed God, and then you go through these circular looks and you know there is <clears throat> God eternal and the creator, then the flood, if he created it from nothing to begin, then he can obviously have a flood. And in, in all those things that science wants to debate, its age of the earth and etc., and man and create, it, it's all answered there. He's totally capable of doing everything and undoing everything, if you will, in order that everything else he says in his word is true. Right. So when you boil down most concerns, when you're dialoguing with someone, if they go back and truly 
understand the depth and significance and awesomeness of one one, everything else can be explained. It's, you know, for people I ask, you know, what was God doing before he created the world and the heavens? You know, in eternity past. Are you going to answer that? Yes. <laughs> well, because, well, the thing about it is, if, if God has always been a pre been in eternity past, and he's been in eternity present, then you start to understand, or pres uh, eternity future, then you understand where God says, I am. God does not have a time frame. He gave man a time frame, and today is day one when he created the earth. God was God is instantaneous. So it's only man who comes up with the time frame of what was God doing before. Well, he exists. Day one was when he created it. There, there, there is no time to God. I think for us to ponder God what God did before really reveals our inability to comprehend the depth of God. Right. Because, you know, you say, well, what was God doing and why did he decide to do creation here? God created time. Yeah. God wasn't flowing through some other time dimension. He simply, as you're echoing or saying, is, he is. He is the one that even got the second hand kicked off right here. And I, I say that because I understand it from Scripture and as I trust the Holy Spirit to reveal it to me so that I can share it with you. But I don't really... Don't, don't make me, don't think that I'm wrapping my brain around it. I've got it figured out. That's, that's, so, that's so beyond my abilities outside of the Holy Spirit's revelation. Anybody else? As a kid, I can remember, I'm talking eight, nine years old, laying in bed trying to conceive of the concept of eternity. Mm -hmm. And it was almost scary yeah. thinking about something that... that and I figured, I can't wait till I get older and I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> How's that worked out for you? <laughs> Future or past eternity yep. is inconceivable because we want to, mm -hmm. we want to frame everything within the, the, the confines of human understanding. And we just can't do that. Either. I've always had a struggle. Is it uh, Just Design? What's the song that has, when we've been there 10,000 years? Yeah. Oh. Amazing, um, Grace. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, Grace yeah. yes. And I'm like, since I got into preaching apologetics, I believe that God you know, started time, and one day He's going to stop time. And I'm always, I'm always saying 10,000 years. Like, no, no, no. It's, you know, it's, it's not that we're going to be doing that kind of life. So, thank you all. Uh, number two, Trinity is foreshadowed. Genesis one through one three. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The idea of Trinity is another one of those, I see it, I hear it, I trust it. But how do you have three persons in one God? Is once again, stretching the bounds of our natural abilities, obviously. <coughs> so, I like, though, as I see this, these first three verses. In the beginning, God, which I see as God the Father, that it says the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep. I see that it's the Holy Spirit. So where's Jesus in this? And God said. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. When God is speaking, Jesus' lips are moving. Trinitarian God, functioning as one God. Yet there's a plurality of personalities here, but all are right. And I love this image that, that comes from these first few verses here in the Bible. Have you has anybody seen that before? Considered that? Because it's a, it's a powerful idea to know that, that Jesus also, and I think sometimes we, we use this term God in a generic fashion sometimes, but to understand that Jesus is also eternal. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says that through Jesus Christ, all things were created by Him, 
for him, both visible and invisible. John 1, 3, again, echoes this idea. There's this connection of this Trinitarian Godhead, and Jesus is the Word, is the spoken one, the Word that became flesh. He is the creator of everything. Also, Tommy, I found it interesting that the first thing after that word said, Lakos, is let there be light. Christ mm -hmm. is light. Mm -hmm. And wherever he shines, darkness disappears. The light got to speak and then, light into existence. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wish I had enough thought for Todd to put that point next about light. So we'll just jump over to the new that one next. <laughs> Let's go to, no, that's a good one. I, I should have had you to read my papers before. <laughs> Let's go to number four. <coughs> because we see Jesus speaking, let there be light into existence. And so the question that I think sometimes comes is, is, what is this light? Where is it coming from? Because where do we get our light from today is, you know, the sun. Of course, in the night we have the moon. But what day, I always like to run these tests by you and see what you're, how you're doing. What day were the sun, moon, and stars created? Three. Three? No. What day, John? No. It's not three. It's <laughs> two. Four. Four. Fourth day. So you've got three days without the sun. Don't we, we, are we running into some problems here? What's going on here? And so people want to reinterpret this idea here. Well, first of all, I believe that um, let's look at the Hebrew here. In this verse here, the Hebrew word for light is or, which I believe what we're seeing described here in creation are the light waves, the visible light waves that we see. Because like this light fixture right here, you'd say turn off the light, and we know we're talking about that fixture, but we also know that really what illuminates this room are light waves that are coming down here, illuminating the room. So you really got two things happening here within that one light fixture. And I believe on day one, Jesus has spoken light waves into existence. And it, to me, it makes sense that all the invisible rays of light or waves of light, UV rays and so on and so forth, would be incorporated into, the, into this idea. Now, the question is, so light's just thrown out there. Where's it coming from? I don't have a, an answer for that question. But I do have a thought I wanted to share with you. Let's look at verse um, 5. <coughs> No, verse 4. Look at verse 4. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. What I see going on here is God has now given light a direction. He's given it a direction to flow through the universe. Now, you've got the world here, the earth. Now, we need light hitting the earth because the other question we're looking at here is how do we get day? If you don't have sun shooting light down here, then how do you get day? And I'm going to suggest that God has directed the light from a particular direction, but we need day to function. Is All we need really is for the earth to rotate. 